Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Down the Rabbit Hole. I'm your host, Anais Sim, and today we have the one and only Gabby Goldberg with us. Gabby is an investor at TCG, or the Chernin Group, where she focuses on the firm's investments at the intersection of consumer and crypto. Gabby has also thought and written a lot about internet culture and online communities, so I'm super excited to have her on the show to dive into these topics. So thanks so much for joining us today, Gabby. Thanks so much for having me. I'm very excited to be here. So excited. Okay, so we like to start off every episode uh, getting to know you a bit better. So to level set here, you know, what's your background and how did you fall down the crypto rabbit hole? Yeah, Um, the story actually starts way earlier than I thought it did. And this is something I've kind of realized recently that like kind of my background growing up and my experiences growing up have really come full circle with the things that I care about today. I don't even know if I've told you this in a, but I actually grew up selectively mute. So when I was like five to 10 years old, I didn't really say anything. I talked a little bit to my parents and my brothers and that was about it. Um, obviously now that's not a part of my life anymore, but the really interesting sort of collateral of that is I grew up spending like a shit ton of time online. So spending a lot of time playing like online games that sort of grew up into playing Minecraft and RuneScape and spending time in these digital worlds and digital communities. Even today, a lot of my friends who I ended up meeting in real life, I met from hanging out on Minecraft for hours as a teenager. Um, Like I learned how to code on Tumblr, trying to add sparkles to my cursor and all of that stuff. And so because of my childhood, kind of like growing up feeling most comfortable online, the idea of like digital community and online culture has always been just top of mind for me. So then when I got to college, I studied computer science and philosophy. Um, But the real things I was interested in were like human computer interaction and and social computing. Um, So like my favorite class was all about how do you grow and scale and moderate social computing systems, anything from, you know, Facebook all the way to Wikipedia. And what does it look like? And where have those things gone wrong? I worked in the virtual reality lab when I was at school, all of these things. Um, Fast forward a few years, now I'm an investor at TCG, and it does feel very, very full circle because, you know, to this day, a lot of my closest friends I've met online and a lot of like the really interesting things that happen in the world start from internet communities and, and internet culture. I love the full circle moment there. And I think about that a lot too. I think, you know, we're of the generation where a lot of our most formative years were spent online. And we've also experienced these different, you know, quote unquote, eras of the internet as we're moving through the world socially as well. So I think that takes me to one of my first questions for you. Just to context that here, I think it's really hard to understand Web3 without understanding Web1 and Web2. And I've heard you speak on this before, and you do an amazing job kind of um, outlining this transition. So can you take us through the evolution of the internet from web one to web two to web three? Yeah, totally. And I I totally agree. Like the homework is really necessary to understand what web three is all about. First, I'll start by saying I think a common misconception and something that was a misconception of mine before I entered the space was that. Web3 is new technology, but also a new value system. I would argue, obviously, the technology is new, but the values of Web3 are not new. Um, First of all, the consumer behaviors are the same, but also um, the values of Web3 really go back to why the internet was started in the first place. So anyway, going back to Web1, it was created in 1989 with this vision of a decentralized and open network of information and data where users would be in control and not platforms. So during this first era of the internet, we saw companies emerge like Google and Yahoo and Amazon. But it's important to note that the consumer experience was pretty shitty. I think it's fun to go back and look at like interviews of people in the early 90s talking about the internet and they almost don't know what it is, right? It was really only designed for highly technical people who knew how to build on top of these open protocols. Um, That obviously changed. So over the next couple of decades, consumers migrated from these open services and open protocols to more centralized ones because they were more sophisticated. Um, And so 
that's kind of like all of the big, you know, like web two social companies that we think of. And so this is sort of where it gets tricky. I don't think this was a net bad thing at all. It was really good because the movement to centralized platforms and more sophisticated platforms gave billions of people across the world access to the internet and all of its technologies. Um, But the problem is in doing so, it also made the internet less innovative and less dynamic because it became harder for individuals and groups and businesses to create things online without concern of these centralized platforms taking control. And I almost think it's something that we have just gotten used to and accepted as normal. There's a couple examples that come to mind for me. One is um, in my last job, I worked really closely with a company that was sort of trying to build like a paywalled Finsta. So if a creator wanted to connect more intimately with their fans, they could download this app and paywall a private account for, you know, five, 10, $20 a month. And then their fans would be able to see sort of like the more personal things that they wouldn't post on their larger accounts. Um, So makes sense. Um, The problem was because it was hosted on the app store, 30% of any revenues that the creator would make would go back to Apple. So Maybe if you're a big business that's hosted on the app store, 30% is just a line on the balance sheet. But for creators who want to make a living online, like we hear all the time about the creator economy, 30% is a lot of money. And so that really hit home for me hearing these personal stories of creators who were affected by that. Another example is a few months ago, I remember when all of the Facebook apps shut down for a day. I still have no idea why, and I don't even think it matters. But the point is, when Facebook and Instagram and WhatsApp and all of these platforms just magically went down for a day, I think a lot of creators and people who make money online realized for the first time, like, wow, I have no ownership of these relationships. And what would it look like if these disappeared tomorrow? Like, where would my livelihood come from? So in my opinion, the goal of Web3 is to combine the decentralization of Web1 with the really powerful consumer experience of web two. And what that will be, what that will do is it'll provide a level playing field and ideally kind of fix the ways that we interact and transact and engage online. I love that. You put that so well. And, you know, going back, going off of this idea of how we interact and engage online, as we've moved through these different evolutions of the internet, how do you think internet culture has evolved over time? That's a good question. I mean, I would say we're at the point now where internet culture just is mainstream culture. So maybe the example I would give is like, maybe it used to be celebrities in Hollywood, and then you would follow them on Instagram. But now we're following internet native influencers, and they're going to Hollywood, and they're kind of defining bottom up what culture should look like. Um, I even think of like, internet native brands and kind of businesses. So like Dumois is one of them, which is like the the gossip account on Instagram, which has like a chokehold on so many people in America who want to see what celebrities are doing, but like not reported by traditional publications. Another example of like an internet native brand that I love is Mischief. And Mischief is really interesting because it doesn't really exist on any platform. It's kind of platform agnostic. So they don't have their own TikTok account. But the hashtag on TikTok, Mischief, has like thousands of tags. So the idea is if all of these platforms went down tomorrow, Mischief would technically still exist, which I think is really interesting. Um, Obviously, there's other like macro trends that are big in Web3 too, like the rise of um, pseudonymity, which is really interesting to see as well. And it has definitely changed the way that people interact um, for good and bad. Um, So... Yeah, it's been a really interesting evolution. Such a great line. Internet culture is culture. And I think you also touched on something interesting there where, you know, these internet native creators are defining what culture should look like. And I know you've written about this in terms of, you know, curators or the new creators. Forgive me if I'm um, misspeaking that title. But do you want to get into that? You know, why you wrote that article and what it was all it was all about? Yeah, totally. So I wrote, you're you're totally right. I wrote this first piece, Curators or the New Creators, probably like two years ago, saying just the general trend I was seeing of like, there's an abundance of information and the new people who will kind of like rise to fame or gain influence will be people who understand how to separate signal from noise. And we're going to look to those curators to tell us where to spend our time. Um, I think that has definitely proven itself to be true more and more. Like accounts that I follow on Instagram, for example, are like, 
High Snobiety, 90s Anxiety, Furniture Archive, New Bottega, all of these accounts are basically just curators. And oftentimes they don't have a person behind the brand. Like the curation is the brand. And that's something that we care about. Um, and then about a year later, I published another piece with my friend, Jesse Lee, who's the founder of this company, Basic Space, called Curators Are the Way Down, Curators All the Way Down. And um, essentially what we realized is culture used to be very top down and now it's starting to be more trickle up. And so the example that we gave was, for example, like, uh, you know, like Kanye West bringing Virgil Abloh up to fame. And what Virgil would do is he would basically like scout on the ground floor of like what was cool on like street level. And those trends would come trickle up and then become the trends as opposed to fashion and culture coming from like big top down couture houses. Um, And so generally, I mean, I think curation, like it's becoming a business in its own right. And I think particularly in web three too, there's a lot of really interesting examples of where curation can be used the one that's top of mind for me is yup.io where you basically earn influence in, earn influence by curating the web which i think is super interesting and there's a lot of like really interesting applications there i also think it all could relate to this whole idea of 100 true fan 100 true fans or 1000 true fans where you have a core community of people who trust your opinion because they know who you are what you're all about um also want to get your take on the more you know, relationship side of internet culture. So how do you think our relationships, whether personal, professional, or romantic, have evolved as the internet has evolved? And I'm also curious how you think about the role and importance of like those in real life interactions and experiences as so much of our online lives are translating to the physical ones as well. Yeah, it's a really good question. I mean, I would love to hear your take on it too, because I think both of us share the experience of like finding a job through the internet. Um, At least for me, the way I got into venture capital is I was working abroad uh, right before COVID. And during that time, I got a Twitter account and I started sharing some of like the writing I was putting up on Twitter and things like that. And when COVID hit, I lost my job and I got sent out of the country. And it was actually on my flight home sitting in SFO that I saw that Jeff Morris, who was the first person who hired me to intern with him at chapter one, posted a tweet saying, I'm hiring an intern. And that was how I kind of fell into venture and everything spiraled from there. And, you know, even my partner today, Jared Dicker at TCG, we met through the internet and we had been friends with the internet before we started working together. Um, Another really interesting thing about internet culture and like the URL to IRL divide that I think about a lot is the first place that kind of made it less taboo to hang out with people who you met online. Uh, The first place was dating, like Match.com and Tinder and all this stuff. And now it's definitely not taboo to say you met your significant other on Tinder, which is crazy. Um, It's interesting because I don't think it has really happened for friendships yet. I don't have any friends who use Bumble BFF, for example. And even, you know, my friends who don't hang out on Twitter are very confused when I say I'm like hanging out with my friends who I met on the internet, right? Like we've moved so far from don't talk to strangers on the internet to like literally I'm flying to Denver to hang out with my online friends. Um, But it's interesting that dating was the first use case. I don't know if you have any thoughts. I mean, like obviously you got your job also through the internet and I'm sure you've had a ton of these similar experiences. Yeah, I love the dating example, too. I think about that a lot. Even, you know, my cousin's wedding this past summer, they met on Bumble, and it is so not taboo anymore. And I do know some people who have used platforms like Bumble BFF, and they've found good friends through those platforms. But it's usually in situations where they're moving to a different location where they don't, you know, know the environment, know the people and the places um, around them. Something that I think about a lot is, you know, building in public in being online, you have to show it, it. It's a certain level of vulnerability that I think is more comfortable to some people than others. I was playing the game, the game. Uh, We're not really strangers. Have you ever played that? I, yeah, I love that game. It's such a great card game for those who are listening and don't know what it's all about. Like basically, it's just conversation starters to get to some like interesting topics and conversations among 
two people or a group of people. But there was this question in the game. It's like, what parts of your personality aren't showed online? You know, when people need to protect Ooh. their personality and their energy. So I'm curious, A, what you think, if you're comfortable even answering that question. And then also being such a public figure online, like, what are the principles that you've abided by to protect your energy, but also, you know, you've built a platform for yourself as an investor and as an individual? Yeah, it's a good question. And I feel like I should have a better answer considering the amount of myself that I put online. Honestly, I think a big reason that I was able to kind of gain like the following and community that I did is I was just like, ruthlessly authentic, just putting out whatever I wanted. Um, even with my writing, like I try not to edit it too much. And I just try and put out like what I'm thinking about. Um, I have no idea if that's a good thing or a bad thing. That's just what I did. Um, but I certainly have been thinking about it more and more. I mean, I feel like I'm very much authentic online, but it's just a piece of me, right? And you can also think like with the fragmentation of platforms, I feel authentic on all of these different platforms. Like I feel authentic on Instagram and I feel authentic on LinkedIn, I guess. And I feel authentic on Twitter, but all of those are just sort of like slippers of me. And there's no holistic sense of identity online. Um, again, I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. And I have no idea if like a web three social graph where I own it and can take it places would change that. Um, so I, I do feel like I try and be authentic online, but certainly there are parts of my life um, and like my friendships and my relationships offline that I try and be sort of like protective of. Um, and of course there are like a lot of examples of, you know, like less than positive experiences happening online and touching people personally. And so I try and be protective of that as well. Um, but I also think like, as we spend more and more time online, the idea of a digital identity is actually really important. Right. And it has changed so much of my life and your life and a lot of our friends' lives. And they're starting to become very much one in the same. And so I'm also not afraid to share parts of myself online because I don't think that trend is slowing down anytime soon. And I want to be able to like express myself in a way that is meaningful to me. Something that you said there that I think is interesting is, and I definitely feel this way. I'm not sure if you do, but like my Twitter self versus my Instagram self versus my TikTok self, I do feel as if I'm being authentic, but like it's a different part of me across these different platforms. It's a different yeah. side of my authenticity. Do you relate to that? And, you know, as we build a more interoperable system and are able to move our digital identity, our fans across platforms with us, how do you think that'll change? Yeah, it's a really good point. The TikTok one is actually a really good example. And I talk about this all the time, but I love TikTok. I think it is the coolest social network. And I think the reason it's so interesting to me is you can feel just as involved or just as a part of something on TikTok, whether you've posted a hundred videos or zero. And like, I've never posted a single video on TikTok. And yet I'm always commenting stuff. Are you reading the comments? People saying like, oh, are we all here from the original video? Or like, oh, I ran to the comments and like, wow, this really said for you page. And it's a crazy sense of community for a platform where so many people are fully anonymous, like no profile picture, pseudonymous name online. Like it's super, super interesting. The other interesting thing, um, and my friend Rohan Kumar uh, tweeted this recently. I'll, I'll try and find it and send it. But he basically said how he was realizing that as opposed to him defining algorithms, like him, you know, kind of like being clear of like what he wanted to see online, algorithms were defining him. Um, and like the things that he likes, and even the people he meets and hangs out with, like, all of these things are consciously or subconsciously defined by algorithms, which is super interesting. And so it's weird and almost sort of like dystopian to think about how have my tastes changed and how have my preferences changed as I've grown up online because of the things that have been recommended to me. And like a lot of that is like memes that I find funny or like things that I see on Pinterest or on Instagram that are recommended to me and like the people that I follow on Twitter. And like, it's like a direct like IV straight into your brain of like all of this information at once. And it's very crazy to know that like you don't have full agency over that. That's a really interesting point. And I think that it also gets to, you know, the 
positives of internet culture, but also the negatives of internet culture. So being someone who, like you said, has spent most of her life online and it's been super formative to, you know, both your personal and professional uh, transformation. In your opinion, you know, what are signs of good internet culture versus toxic internet culture? One example of good internet culture would be just generally open source software and open source collaboration. A good example there is Wikipedia. I'm pretty sure this might have changed, but I'm pretty sure Wikipedia is literally the most visited site on the internet. Um, We've all used it. Like, I don't need to justify that. But it's crazy. Like, Wikipedia is like a nonprofit organization, basically. Like, they run on donations, which is also wild. And like, maybe Wikipedia should be a DAO, so they don't have to do that anymore. Um, But Wikipedia is like, kept up just by open source contributors and collaborators online, which is crazy because, you know, it's grown to be so, so big. I think that's a really good sign of like good internet culture. Another one, like I talked about is like community on places like TikTok and how recommendation systems and algorithms can actually bring people together. Um, Bad internet culture. I mean, we're seeing a lot of, especially recently, like we were talking about this before we started recording, but just kind of, um, I don't know how to say this, like uh, negative or like, you know, like just not very positive information or words being promoted online. Um, And it does kind of raise the question of like, what level of censorship or moderation is needed in these online spaces, especially as we move to a more anonymous or pseudonymous culture online. Um, I remember even like in one of my social computing classes that I took in school, I'm all for anonymity online. And I think we've seen a lot of really interesting use cases of people who don't want to reveal their identities can contribute really meaningful work, particularly in Web3. But when people are anonymous, they're more likely to contribute to hate speech online. Um, Or like, for example, if people are online late at night, they're more likely to contribute to negative speech online. And so how do we combat these things without necessarily censoring them is a tough question that I don't think we've solved yet. Yeah, that's definitely top of mind for me as well. And I think in this space in general, as we are moving towards an internet culture where people are, I don't want to use the word hiding, but hiding is a bad word, but using um, pseudonymous profiles or anonymous profiles. Um, Okay, getting into DAO, so I I thought it was really interesting how you said that Wiki should be a DAO. And I tend to agree with you on that. It's especially kind of defeating almost when you go to a Wikipedia page and they're basically begging for your money. And I'm sure you can relate. Like I've used Wikipedia all my life. It's gotten me through some tough times in school for sure. (laughs) So uh, 100%. 100%. So what do you perceive as the major unlock of DAOs? Yeah. Um, I mean, like on the Wikipedia thing, thing I, I think there's so many sort of like community run or community powered sites that would benefit from community ownership so wikipedia is one of them like strava runs on its community or something like soundcloud where it's really like a community of artists and their fans like all of these things would really benefit from uh kind of like community run networks can I you expand major- on that I- can you expand on that idea of community ownership because i feel like that's really critical to DAOs, and i want to hear your take on it Yeah, I mean, I think something, I I guess I'll use the SoundCloud example for a second. I'll try and see if I can generalize it is like, as a fan, let's say you discover someone on SoundCloud, and you're leaving comments on their songs, and you're following them, and you have like a relatively intimate relationship with that artist, and they know who you are. As you support that artist and try to get them to, to grow bigger, your experience as a fan actually gets worse when it should be getting better. Um, like it's like an inverse relationship when it should be direct. Um, you know, like concert tickets get more expensive. They probably get more followers and forget who you are, or like your comment is drowned out in a sea of other ones and the merch gets more expensive and all this stuff. Um, and ideally if networks were community run, like you would have a real stake and upside in that kind of growth. Um, and I think all of that could be generalized to other just sort of networks that are already, you know, managed and sort of governed by communities. The other thing I think about a lot is uh, governance minimization, which I know Fred Ursum talks about a lot. But um, my friend Kieran and I, Kieran is amazing. He's working on like a social protocol called Verse. Um, And late last year, we sort of like hacked together this project called DAM, a decentralized autonomous media network, basically like asking what would a media network look like if it were governed by its users, like take Instagram, for example. Um, 
And the idea that we thought about there is like with governance minimization, every action that we take on these networks is kind of an act of governance. Um, and so governance doesn't have to just be like voting on snapshot proposals, which like most of the time I don't even do because I forget. Uh, but governance might be like spamming the feed on Instagram or using a certain string of hashtags or posting a really curated set of information. Like all of those things are acts of governance and they change the way the network is used and run. Um, and if that could actually be baked in to the way the network is operated at like an infrastructure level, um, perhaps that could change the way that these networks run. So like Instagram, for example, you know, when they replaced the post a photo tab with the shopping tab. I don't think users actually wanted that. Um, and if the network were community owned and operated, the governance minimization of people spending t- less time on Instagram may- maybe would have reversed that decision. Um, so anyway, back to the major <laughs> unlock of DAOs, which I think was your initial question. I actually think we haven't really even seen the true potential of what DAOs could be used for. And I don't know if I'm one to speculate, but generally i think it's less about uh it's less about the tool itself and more about like what we can actually do with it and we're just beginning to scratch the surface um i think one big really like one interesting web3 unlock will be taking all of these sort of like incentive experiments like DAOs for coordination and nfts or social tokens for kind of commerce and leveraging them for good basically leveraging them for um, kind of like advancements in climate or philanthropy and things like that. Um, And again, I think we're just beginning to scratch the surface. I'm not sure if you have any thoughts. I mean, you work much more intimately in DAOs than I do. No, I totally agree. And I think the tools themselves, but what you can do with them. And I think also what we're seeing is the amount of money you can raise within a DAO. And also, like we're talking about community ownership, part of community ownership within a DAO, like you touched on, is financial alignment with that group. So the example you gave, the SoundCloud example, if I'm a part of an artist community, for example, and I'm a really loyal fan, and I purchased one of their songs as an NFT or one of their videos as an NFT, I'm I'm tied to the financial upside of that community. And it's almost like an investment into that community. Um, there's a lot going on in the investment DAO space. And as a VC, I definitely want your take on this in terms of how do you see investment DAOs, but also DAOs more broadly, altering the venture landscape? Oh, totally. Um, I mean, like, as an example, like, the biggest kind of platform for investment DAOs syndicate, I think is incredible. And I think, you know, I, I saw someone write this online, I can't remember who, um, but they basically wrote a lot of DAOs, like, they organize around a mission, like, let's go after this goal. But in actuality, they spend up they end up spending a lot of their time figuring out like how do we best be a DAO? Like how do we structure this? How do we do governance? And they almost get distracted from the main goal. And tools like Syndicate are amazing because they allow groups to actually just focus on what they wanted to do, right? And like the how to DAO question gets solved, which I think is great. Generally, I mean, venture is totally being disrupted in like a million different ways from a million different sides. And so it's something I think about a lot. Web3 aside, I think venture has kind of turned into this growing barbell where you've got really, really big funds that are almost turning into like the next generation of banks. And we all know which ones those are. And so they can invest large sums of capital. They can invest incredibly early. And the important thing is they can price out other investors and just be super aggressive and proactive. Um, Then on the other side of the barbell, you've got a growing number of like seed funds where I am and solo GPs and like very small funds that kind of know their swim lane like they know what they're good at and they know what they're looking for and and founders know the same like they know what the value add would be if they partnered with that group and then you've got a lot of kind of like traditional venture firms that have been in the middle that maybe have succeeded in the past but are struggling to kind of find a way to to separate from that crowd which i think is super interesting then throw in you know like the growth of syndicates into the mix um, a ton of people angel investing way more than ever before because of platforms like Republic, et cetera, et cetera. And now you have Web3 syndicates or Web3 investment DAOs. I think the general result of all of this 
is a really good thing, which is it puts pressure on venture firms to actually add value besides their capital, right? Like it is no longer the VC in the driver's seat. I mean, there's been more than one occasion where we have pitched ourselves to the founding team as opposed to the other way around. And I think that's how it should be, right? Like capital is very, very abundant, especially with the rise of all of these new tools and platforms. And so, you know, the end goal at the end of the day is supporting founders and helping them on their mission. And so I think this is a good thing in making that more competitive. How do you see that value at shifting in a Web3 landscape? And I'm curious for you here because um, you're someone who is very articulate and also knows how to write really well. And I think that brand narrative of Web3 companies is super important. So don't want, I guess that was kind of a leading question. But how do you see the value oh, at shifting in a Web? <laughs> <laughs> that was a lovely leading question. Thank you for asking. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm very biased, right? But I will, I'll tell you my biased perspective, which is crypto for many years overlooked this idea of messaging, marketing, brand building, accessibility, because quite honestly, it wasn't super important for the needs that needed to be met. Um, Crypto has evolved over the last few years. And now, especially over the last probably two years, I would say these values are hugely important, right? If we want to scale this ecosystem to the next 10, 20, 100 million users, you actually do kind of have to think about like a brand strategy and optimizing SEO and what does it mean to have a growth marketer on your team? And what does it mean to have a community lead? Like it's so important to have someone lead community and content and accessibility on your platform. Um, And so I think that's what makes TCG crypto very valuable. Obviously I'm super biased by saying that, but that's why I decided to join this team is I think that's something that's lacking in the ecosystem from a venture perspective, right? So, you know, let's say you're a crypto founder raising money and you need help with tokenomics or regulation or hiring engineers. Um, I mean, these are still very important problems, but there are a lot of funds and there are a lot of groups who help in that space. What I think is more lacking is if you need a consumer fund on your cap table who understands the value of Web3. And if you care at all about distribution and scaling your platform or your community to the next 100 million users entering the space who may look very, very different than the people who are in crypto today, I think we are very well positioned to help add value on that front. I love that. And I know something that you and I are both passionate about and I look up to you in a lot of ways for is really bridging this translation gap from Web 2 to Web 3. And like you're talking about, I think that's super important to bring in different types of people other than, you know, the standard ones that we're seeing today, which brings me to my next uh, question. I know you've talked about this tweet a couple of times and it stuck out to me a lot. And I think it's an important one. It was Paris Ruzzotti from IDEO VC. She said, If we create a world of more exclusive groups based on even more exclusive assets, what have we really done for humanity? Is this what we are calling decentralization? So, you know, why is this important to you? How do you think about exclusivity in Web3? And what do you think needs to be done for us to create a more equitable space? Yep. Well, shameless plug. That's why I'm so excited by platforms like Rabbit Hole. Um, Actually, the person who informed my thinking the most on this topic was the rabbit hole Sherpa himself, Brian. Um, And he really informed my thinking on this piece I wrote, The Social Token Paradox. Basically, the gist of it, um, and I don't mean this to bash any social token communities at all. I mean, they're like pioneers in the space and doing things that haven't been done before. But a trend that we have seen is the value of a community is often proportional to its token price, right? And so like when FWB skyrockets in token price, it makes the news and people are really excited and they want to buy in. Um, But what it does is it makes it more exclusive, right? Because it doesn't look good for a community to make the price go down. So the only way that you can get new contributors and new users into your community is either to lower the price or to increase the token supply. And neither of those are good for what the community actually wants. The problem is this results in uh, a lot of these groups being focused around what you have, right? Do you have 75 FWB? And again, I know this is changing. They have an amazing scholarship program and the bounty program to join FWB. So 
I'm using that as an example, but maybe I shouldn't be. But it's like, do you have a certain number of tokens? Do you have this NFT? Do you have this amount of capital to join this community? And that's not what Web3 is about. And the vast majority of people entering crypto won't have that amount of assets, right? Like crypto today is 1% of what crypto will be in a decade if we do it right. Um, and so, I, I mean, what Ravel is trying to do, you can probably say it better than I can, is make a lot of these communities and make these ecosystems much less about what you have and much more about what you do. And so I think the main way to solve exclusivity in Web3 is to move towards that, right? You can join a community if you have done these things, if you have contributed to these communities, right? If you stand for these values based on what you have done that is logged on chain. And I think that's the best way to make this a more inclusive space. But but curious to hear your thoughts too. 100%. I mean, that was definitely a big reason for me joining Rabbit Hole. And I don't th- even, you know, of course, we're trying to build that at Rabbit Hole, but I also think it'll lead to a more prosperous Web3 ecosystem in general, where you can take what you've done in one situation and apply it to others. And, you know, it's a really positive feedback loop in that sense. Do you think that... um DAOs and communities are introducing tokens too early in some cases? Yes. I even think about it with DAM, which I talked about a little bit earlier. I'm really having this like internal struggle because I actually think the idea is very cool and I want to spend more time working on it. But I think we totally messed up by launching the DAM token very early. And all of a sudden there was a lot of conversation around token price and why people were in the community. And we actually didn't really build much. Um, And now I'm trying to figure out how do we kickstart this organization again and get this going to make this work without stirring up all of this discussion around the token price. And I think if we would have waited a lot longer, things would have been much easier. And so at at a very high level, like I think communities should wait much longer until the community is self-sustaining without any need for like financial speculation there as well. You can even think of like communities that exist on Discord today, right? Like so many people say they're a part of NFT communities, but many of those NFT communities, the community is just talking about floor price and like pumping and dumping and people saying, no, diamond hands, diamond hands. Like that's not a real community, right? And so the most interesting NFT communities to me are ones that are based on other things, right? Like Crypto Covens is a good example. They're so focused on education and accessibility in the space. And people don't really talk about the floor price all that much. Yeah, I 100% agree and huge Crypto Coven fan as well. Um, Last thing on DAOs that I want to get your thoughts on, and that's interesting that, you know, you're looking at DAM from this perspective, and I appreciate like your vulnerability in talking about the project too. You know, what are some core principles of community building that you think DAOs should follow? And I ask this because Mm -hmm. as someone who's been intimately involved in online communities for most of her life, I think you'd have a cool perspective here. Yeah. So I think the first one is pretty self-explanatory, but just co-ownership, right? People deserve to have collective ownership of the communities that they contribute to. And then the other two that I was thinking about are mostly based around like problems that we see in DAOs today. Um, One is you join a DAO and it's kind of hard to know like what's going on or where you can add value. And so I think like knowledge bases or kind of like almost like a historian for a DAO to keep track of what has actually happened, what problems have been solved, like what solutions have been created and what is still outstanding is really, really important to build and also make like crazy public to the people who are in the DAO. So they know at any given moment what is happening across all of the different things that are going on. I think the other one that is kind of tough is like the information asymmetry on like, how do I join how do I leave if I want to? And what does it mean to be a contributor? Um, I've joked about this before, but (laughs) I basically said like, there should be almost like a frat rushing process for joining a DAO. And I'm mostly kidding, but the fraternity rush process kind of makes a lot of sense of like, you show up, you get a very high level of like what each community stands for and what they do. And then maybe you go back the next day and you've decided, okay, these like four speak to me. Like I like the people in these communities. And then they also pick you and they say, we're looking for people with these ty- types of traits. Um, I'm not saying DAOs should be frats, <laughs> but that idea of like the rush process and being able to see at a high level, what is out there for you, I think would be very valuable. Um, 
And so kind of like getting more information symmetry on like what it means to join, what it means to leave if you decide it's not for you, but also how to maximize the amount of people joining and staying and becoming really high quality contributors. So I guess to sum it up, one is like collective ownership. Two is a public knowledge base for people who are contributors. And then three is kind of more clear information on what it means to to join and leave. The frat example is interesting because I also feel like, you know, to feel a part of being involved in a community is shared experience. And that's, I mean, I'm I'm not a part of a frat, but <laughs> from Same. friends who are, that's <laughs> what I hear. But I also love what you're saying about the other points. I talk about this with um, Chase Chapman a lot. I think that DAOs are a really different type of organizational structure. And it's important to embed a culture of context, like there's so much going on. And for people to make meaningful decisions and contributions, they need that necessary context. And also to the culture of contribution is very different and positive in a lot of ways because you can make an impact, um, you know, at your very early stages, but understanding how you can take initiative, where to take initiative, et cetera, is super important. So I love that answer. Um, you know, Gabby, you have such an amazing, you're in a position where you're getting to see so many different types of projects all over the space as an investor at TCG. I'm curious, what are you most interested in or excited or excited about in Web3 right now? Yeah. Um, one of the things I love about being at TCG is our team comes from such a diverse background and like such diverse perspectives. And so really anything across Web3, we're excited about and we will look at. For me personally, the things that I'm getting excited about right now, and I'm just spending more time learning, I don't even necessarily have a POV yet. I'm just trying to soak it all up. One is just mobile applications for Web3. Um, the same way the shift to mobile, like first of all, introduced so many new businesses, but also brought so many new people online and onto these ecosystems. I think the same thing will happen with mobile. And you know, even with my friends who don't know anything about crypto, when they want to get involved, telling them they have to get like a Chrome extension for a wallet and all of these things that like you have to be stuck to your computer. Mobile first is so much more intuitive for a lot of people who aren't in the space. And so I've seen a lot of really fun mobile games, just mobile, just consumer apps. I mean, like Rainbow is a good example. I spend so much time on Rainbow versus any other wallet. Um, another one is just digital fashion. Honestly, again, I don't have a POV. I'm just really excited. And so anybody in digital fashion, I just want to meet and learn from them. Um, and then the last one is applications of Web3 Media. So things like Mad Realities are super, super interesting to me. And what does it look like to create incentives to create um, kind of new and interactive media? Yeah, Mad Realities is a super interesting example. Want to give like a 30 second explainer on that? Yeah, so Mad Realities, right now what they're building is an interactive dating show called Proof of Love. And so they had an NFT drop. And what the NFT does, if you own one, is it kind of brings you into like the writer's room. So earlier this week in the Discord, everybody who had an NFT was able to vote on who they thought the host of Mad Reality should be. And so we were all hanging out in the Discord, bringing the hosts up, asking them questions. It's super interactive. And ideally, I mean, I'm just spitballing here. I'm not sure what the actual plans are, but maybe you could imagine people who have ownership in the show can say, oh, who do we want to give a rose to this week? Or like, where should the next episode be filmed? And what the, what should they do for the next date? And all these fun ideas. Um, I mean, reality TV already feels so interactive, right? Like my friend groups like gather around every week to watch The Bachelor and things like that. And what would it mean if you actually had a say in the outcome of the show? Um, I think is super interesting. Also, when we think about accessibility, this is something that my friends who don't know and don't care about crypto would love. And I think it's important to kind of level set like I or like we as a crypto native community are, we should not be the people to say like, this is what crypto, uh, like this is what people need to be like to join this space. Um, I said that pretty, <laughs> I said that terribly, but the way I think about it is like, for example, um, Zed Run has an amazing community. It's like an incredible platform, an incredible game. I personally am not interested in playing. Like that's not the community that I find myself aligned with, but it's not my job to say, this is where people should spend their time in Web3. And I think like the more we can create across different perspectives, um, different ideas, you know, like different communities, 
we make room for more and more people. And so Mad Realities is a really cool example of a community that almost hasn't really been touched yet in crypto. Another example is like the Creature NFT project. There are so many traditional artists and designers and musicians who are finding such a home in that community that never found one before. Um, So now I'm rambling, but Mad Realities is just an example of one that I'm really excited about. Uh, No, I super resonate with that. And that's been top of mind for me lately is how can we expand the use cases and applications of Web3 technology to cater to a different type of interest, to a different type of demographic? I even think about how so much of crypto is like on crypto Twitter. I haven't seen a lot of platforms do it well on Instagram or TikTok, you know, one that sticks out as boys club. But besides that, you know, we got to get out there more. Um. Gabby, I could talk to you for hours, but we do have to wrap this up. But before we end, so I don't know if you know this, but with every guest, we play a little game called This or That. Okay. (laughs) This 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 is why I was asking you about we'll we'll get into it. But (laughs) basically, I'm just going to give you there's 10 sets of two words. I'm just going to say two different words and you pick your preference for one or the other. It's a rapid fire type of game. No explanation needed. It's actually better without any explanation. Um, okay. I'm okay. ready. You, re- you ready? Okay. Web3 or crypto? Web3. Bitcoin or E? ETH. Discord or Telegram? Oh. Telegram? Bear market or bull? bear market new york or la Ooh, i live in new york but la (laughs) writing or reading reading investing or building oh (laughs) can i say building yeah (laughs) twitter threads or long form blog posts long form blog posts kanye or tyler the creator kanye Kanye or Lauren Hill? Kanye. Okay. Music or podcasts? (laughs) Music. Okay. Nice. Nice. That's it. That's it. It We're done. That was pretty famous. That was stressful. That was stressful. (laughs) Yeah. You guys have to watch the YouTube video if you're listening to see Gabby's reactions during those. I'm like crying right now. (laughs) (laughs) Well, thank you so much, Gabby, for coming on. This was a really incredible conversation. I appreciate your perspective as someone who you know, like you said, has spent a lot of her life online and has seen a lot of different parts of the internet. Um, Thank you so much, audience, for tuning in, and we will see you on the next episode of Down the Rabbit Hole. Bye, everyone. Thank you so much. Guide you down.